Hi, I'm the History Guy, and if you didn't know, in addition to our channel on YouTube, we also have a page on Patreon, where for just $3 a month, you can support the work that we do here at the History Guy. And one of the things you get in exchange for your patronage is one exclusive episode a month that goes just to our patrons on Patreon. And for about the last year, that's been a series on the History Guy's hat. And occasionally, like when I'm traveling, we're able to bring an older one of those episodes to the YouTube audience. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. The episode you're going to see today originally aired last May, and it has to do with something that's very near and dear to the heart of people who collect things, and that is an item that is named. And by that we mean that we know through good provenance who owned the item. And that way, when you own that item, you don't become just a steward of the item's history and the era that it represents, but also the person who owned it and their history. The hat that I'm going to talk about today belonged to someone whose name you probably don't recognize, and yet whose accomplishments were significant and lasting. It also represents a dynamic era in American history, and is emblematic of one of the most important, but least appreciated roles of the United States military. It is history that deserves to be remembered. We don't always think about army generals as academics. Lovers of history tend to be more excited about how they win battles. And yet many of the great generals in history have been engineers. George Gordon Meade attended West Point, largely because he could not afford tuition at another university, graduating in 1835. He did not intend a career in the military, intending instead to be a civil engineer. He joined the Army Corps of Engineers, serving what was at the time the separate Corps of Topographical Engineers engaged in many engineering projects, being responsible for the construction of lighthouses and breakwaters, many of which still stand today. His survey of the Great Lakes in the 1850s would be useful as the U.S. and Canada developed the St. Lawrence Waterway 90 years later. Meade's career was surprisingly similar to one of his contemporaries, Robert Edward Lee. Lee had also attended West Point, graduating second in his class in 1829. Like Meade, he served in the Corps of Engineers. He helped to map the state line between Ohio and Michigan, supervised work on St. Louis Harbor, and mapped the Des Moines Rapids. During the war with Mexico in 1846, Lee served on the staff of General Winfield Scott. There's no clear record that he met George Meade, seven years his junior, who was serving on the staff of General Zachary Taylor. But the two West Point engineers would eventually meet. Meade's first field command was as a Brigadier General of Volunteers in 1861. On June 28, 1863, President Lincoln appointed him commander of the Army of the Potomac. Three days later, the army he commanded confronted the Army of Northern Virginia near the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Commanding that army was fellow West Point engineer Robert E. Lee. The careers of these two generals, whose army met in the epic Battle of Gettysburg, July 1st through 3rd, 1863, a battle that many consider to be the most important and decisive of the U.S. Civil War, demonstrates that intimate relationship that has been recognized since antiquity between engineers and armies. But their work also demonstrates the important role that military engineers have played in civil society. The works that these two men did as part of the Army Corps of Engineers still exist today, and in many ways it represents a more lasting legacy than anything they did on the field of battle. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been around in some form since 1775, and the Corps deserves to be remembered. One such work is the St. Lawrence Seaway. The St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project has been described as being outranked only by the Panama Canal as an engineering project. The project is a system of locks, canals, and channels in Canada and the United States that permits ocean-going vessels to travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes of North America. While coordination on a project between the governments of the United States and Canada was proposed in 1890, the project faced obstacles, and it wasn't until 1932 that a Treaty of Intent was signed. By 1941, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Mackenzie King made an executive agreement to build the joint hydro and navigation works on the seaway, although funding for the agreement depended upon Congress. These works entailed some 15 miles of canals to bypass the Long Sioux Rapids of the St. Lawrence River and build two immense dams and power plants, which would jointly produce 2.2 million kilowatts of power, one each in Canada and the United States. The project would have included the construction of six locks, the largest being 110 feet wide, enough to accommodate the largest ocean-going vessels. It was a massive project that faced opposition from competing interests such as U.S. East Coast ports and railroads. The project was estimated at the time to cost an astounding $237 million. 
For a project that size, the U.S. had only one organization to which to turn, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Included in the project was an extensive survey required to determine the scope of the engineering needs. The Army appointed a young captain in the Corps of Engineers, a Rhodes Scholar, as the assistant engineer on that survey project. His name was Alden Kingsland Sibley, and this hat belonged to him. Alden Sibley was born January 3, 1911, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the son of Frederick Sibley and Julia Pearson Sibley. It's easy to see how he got his interest in engineering because his father, Frederick, was one of the most famous engineers in America at the time. After being on faculty at the University of Alabama and then a department chair at the University of Kansas, he was hired to be dean of the School of Engineering at the University of Nevada, Reno. And in 1921, he moved his family there when his son Alden was just nine years old. Frederick was dean of the school for 20 years until his death in 1941. He wrote textbooks, led engineering organizations, engineered innovations from processes to create synthetic fuel to a high voltage process to sterilize milk. And he raised his son in an intellectual atmosphere that would serve him well. Alden graduated from Reno High School where, according to the newspaper, he earned a cash prize for getting top grades in his class. Spent another year at the University of Nevada where he also earned top grades and in 1929 was appointed to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. But like George Meade, Sibley did not enter the academy with the idea of being a soldier. Rather, he was first and foremost an engineer. In 1963, he told the Detroit Free Press, I originally wanted to be a college professor teaching physics, and I was interested in West Point because it offered the best fundamental engineering education in the country. At West Point, he was a captain of the gymnasium team, but he excelled in academics. He graduated eighth in his class of 347 in 1933. He was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Corps of Engineers, but was selected for a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship, allowing him to study at Magdalen College, Oxford University. He studied for three years, specializing in the study of cosmic rays, attending a Master of Science degree in nuclear physics, and spending a year on a trip around the world for the university, measuring the radiation from cosmic rays. Upon graduation, he was described as one of the three leading authorities in the world on cosmic rays. In a sign of Sibley's intelligence and promise, when he returned from his studies at Oxford, he was promoted to first lieutenant and appointed as a military aide to President Franklin Roosevelt. He was then an engineer with a Corps, building the Conscious Dam in New Mexico and the John Martin Dam in Colorado, before being assigned to the St. Lawrence Waterway Survey, although the St. Lawrence Waterway Project failed to get funding from Congress at the time. During the war, he served as the District Engineer of the North Africa Engineer District and as the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Middle East Theater of Operations, and then Commanding Officer of the Eritrea and Tripoli Commands. He helped to plan the D-Day invasion and to establish the Supreme Headquarters Allied Forces Europe mission to France, where he was Chief of Staff, finishing the war as a colonel. For his service, he was awarded the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star, the Army Commendation Medal, the Order of the British Empire, the French Legion of Honor, and the Croix de Guerre. But while he served in various staff and command roles, he never wandered far from the role of an engineer. He earned his first star as a Brigadier General when he became the Division Engineer of the New England Division of the Corps of Army Engineers, where he was responsible for a number of flood control and dam building projects. In 1960 and 61, he served as the Deputy Chief of the U.S. Military Assistance Advisory Group to Vietnam, working with the Diem government. There he studied engineering solutions for fighting guerrilla warfare like the nation and its allies were facing at the time. Experience that he used when he was appointed Deputy Chief of Engineers for Military Operations in 1961. Being promoted to Major General, he then served as the Commanding General of the newly created U.S. Army Mobility Command, now called the Tank Automotive and Armaments Command, from 1962 to 1964, and Deputy Chief of Staff Logistics for U.S. Army Europe. Thus he applied this engineering expertise to military challenges during the most dangerous parts of the Cold War. He also served on the staff of the Army War College, as a member of the War Department General Staff, as Commanding General of the 11th U.S. Army Corps, and Deputy Commanding General of the 5th U.S. Army. He retired in 1968. And while it's great to know the story behind who wore this U.S. Army Major General's tropical dress hat, the career of Alden K. Sibley, shown here as a young lieutenant, is not just distinguished in itself, but it is a legacy that is held in the various flood control projects and dams whose construction he supervised, and so gives an opportunity to talk about the important and underappreciated work of the United States Army Corps of Engineers. When Congress first authorized an army in 1775, it included a chief engineer and two assistants. 
The first chief engineer was Colonel Richard Gridley, who prepared the defensive works at Bunker Hill, and later at Dorchester Heights, which compelled the British to evacuate Boston. In 1799, Congress created a separate corps of engineers, which was at the time led by a French officer, Louis Duporte, who prepared the siege works at the Battle of Yorktown. In 1802, the Military Peace Establishment Act was passed under President Thomas Jefferson. The act was designed to define the U.S. military, but among its purposes was to establish a school for engineers that would allow the U.S. to train its own loyal engineers rather than rely on foreign trained engineers. That act established a corps of engineers as it exists today and directed them to be stationed at West Point in New York, where they were to establish an academy for engineers. Thus, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point was originally established to train American engineers, and until 1866, the superintendent was always an engineer. That is one reason that so many officers in the Civil War, including Lee and Meade, but also George McClellan and Joseph Johnston, were engineers. Early projects by the Corps building fortifications around New York Harbor deterred the British from attacking the harbor during the War of 1812. Those fortifications included a star-shaped fort on what was then called Bedlow Island, that would later become the base for the Statue of Liberty. As the only trained body of engineers in the country, the Corps of Engineers' role was not limited to military needs. In 1824, Congress passed the General Survey Act, which authorized the President to have surveys made of routes for transport, roads, and canals of national importance in a commercial or military point of view, or necessary for the transportation of public mail. It also approved funds to remove sandbars, snags, and other obstacles to improve navigation on the Ohio and Mississippi River, jobs that were given to the Corps. Much of the American West was mapped by the Corps of Topographical Engineers. The Corps also constructed lighthouses, helped develop jetties and piers for harbors, and carefully mapped navigation channels. Thus, much of American expansion in the 19th century was facilitated by the Corps. Engineers on both sides played vital roles during the Civil War, establishing fortifications and trench works, building roads, bridges, and railroads. The Confederate Army created its own Confederate Corps of Engineers, which was generally considered to be superior in the creation of field fortifications than its Union counterparts, contributing to the heavy Union losses at the battles of Vicksburg and Cold Harbor. Their innovations would change U.S. strategic thinking. Due to funding issues, the construction of the Washington Monument, started in 1848, was halted in 1859. When construction of the monument was restarted in 1879, it was completed by the Corps of Engineers. Corps of Engineers, led by Army Major George Washington Gothels, also took over and completed the Panama Canal between 1907 and 1914. The Flood Control Act of 1936 made the Corps responsible for flood control projects such as dams, levees, and dikes. The act created one of the central and most important roles of the Corps. Since 1936, Congress has authorized the Corps of Engineers to construct hundreds of miles of levees, flood walls, and channel improvements in approximately 375 major reservoirs. Historian Joseph Arnold said of the Corps flood control projects, including some supervised by Alden Sibley, they have saved billions of dollars in property damage and protected hundreds of thousands of people from anxiety, injury, and death. They stand today as one of the more significant marks of our technical skill and humane spirit. The projects also meant that the Corps became a major provider of hydroelectric energy, producing nearly a quarter of U.S. hydroelectric power at 75 plants, and is the country's leading provider of outdoor recreation. The Corps reservoirs also provide some 4 billion gallons of water per day for domestic and agricultural use. Following the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, the Corps took on responsibilities regarding disaster preparedness, relief, and recovery. Today, the Corps responds to an average of 30 presidential disaster declarations a year. During the Second World War, the Corps was responsible for construction of the huge expansion of bases needed to train and supply a vastly expanded military. At its peak, in 1942, the Corps built 149 munitions and aircraft manufacturing plants and constructed depots with 205 million square feet of storage space. Between 1941 and 1943, the Corps built the world's largest office building, the Pentagon, completing the building housing more than 6.6 .6 million square feet of office space in just 18 months. One of the most significant of the projects placed under the responsibility of the Corps of Engineers during the war was the Manhattan Project, the effort to produce an atomic bomb. The project was a massive effort of research, development, and civil engineering that over four years cost $2 billion, at the time the most expensive public works project ever undertaken in the United States. Its results ended the war and forever transformed the world. Among the Corps' many projects, in 1957, Congress finally approved funding for the work on the U.S. side for the St. Lawrence Seaway, the project for which Sibley had helped do the survey in 1940 and 41. 
The core efforts, however, have not been without controversy. In a 2009 report released by the Army Corps of Engineers, internal investigators cited uncoordinated construction and outdated information for the failure of flood walls in New Orleans in 2005 during Hurricane Katrina, resulting in catastrophic flooding. In their own report, Corps leadership took full responsibility for the flooding. Still, people who filed claims against the Corps for damages have been unable to receive awards because federal law shields the Corps from lawsuits because of the failure of flood control systems. The federal judge handling the case remarked, I feel obligated to know that the bureaucratic behemoth that is the Army Corps of Engineers is virtually unaccountable to the citizens it protects. There were similar complaints about the cost of cleanup after Hurricane Sandy in 2012, where it cost the Corps nearly twice as much per cubic yard to remove debris as a private contractor. Over the years, Corps projects have received criticism for being politicized and riddled with political patronage, a flaw that is attributable perhaps more to the process of funding and authorization than to engineering, and there have been recent calls for reform to the Corps and increased oversight. The Corps of Engineers today consists of more than 37,000 civilian and military personnel delivering engineering services in the United States into more than 130 countries worldwide. It is one of the world's largest public engineering design and construction management agencies. The Corps supports 260 Army and Air Force installations, owns and operates 609 dams and 257 navigable lock chambers, operates and maintains some 12,000 miles of inland navigation channels, and maintains deep water ports through which more than 67% of the goods consumed by Americans pass. The Corps plays a vital role in environmental stewardship and restoration, cleaning up areas formerly contaminated by military bases and activities, and helping to establish and reestablish wetlands for species to thrive. Today, the 37,000 members of the United States Army Corps of Engineers stand ready to fulfill their mission, to provide vital public and military engineering services, partnering in peace and in war to strengthen our nation's security, energize its economy, and reduce risks from disasters. Alden K. Sibley, who himself was a registered professional engineer, remained active his entire life in engineering organizations like the Society of Military Engineers and the American Society of Civil Engineers. He passed away in 1999 at the age of 88. There are many reasons to collect historical artifacts, but one reason is that if you are a collector, that means that you are preserving a piece of history. I am proud to be a steward of this historical artifact to help to remember the extraordinary officer who owned this hat and the Corps in which he served. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy it, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>